We've got to get out of here, Mandy gasped. She crawled back along the tunnel as fast as she could, this time hitting her forehead on a protruding rock. Her skin stung, but there was no time to stop. The river was rising fast, fed by a torrential rain from above. The river's flooding. We have to get out, Mandy said urgently. Amber stared at him in alarm. How? She glanced at her ankle. I've already tried once. Well, have to climb out, said Mandy. I'll help you, and I'll carry Frisbee in the backpack. She took the bag from Amber gently, put Frisbee inside, then eased it over her shoulders. The puppy didn't protest. Having traveled inside the backpack for a few days, she must have felt quite at home in there. A born pocket beagle, Mandy thought. She held out her hand and helped Amber up. As soon as Amber was on her feet, she sucked in her breath and stumbled against the rocky wall, taking the weight off her injured ankle. Amber huddled up against the side of the cave. This is all my fault, she said, sobbing. Mandy said nothing. She was busy trying to come up with another plan. You climb out, Mandy. You and Frisbee continue. No. Sorry, what's up? You climb out, Mandy. You and Frisbee, continued Amber. Her words shattered Mandy's concentration. And leave you here? She exclaimed. I never do that. It's your only choice, insisted Amber. Frisbee's too. Above the sound of the rising river came a new noise, like a tap being turned on and left to run. It could only mean one thing. Water had started to flow along the tunnel toward them, but it was only when Mandy saw a narrow stream trickling through the entrance to the tunnel that she realized just how close it was. It's coming in here already, she said, trying not to panic. Suddenly, she remembered the fork in the tunnel. Perhaps it would lead them away from the water. Whenever it went, it was their only hope. Do you think you can crawl, Amber? I'm sure I can. Good. Follow me. Mandy dropped onto her hands and knees and heaved the backpack around so that it hung underneath her, like a kangaroo's pouch. Just hang in there, little one, she murmured to Frisbee. Then she stared up the tunnel once more. She tried to stay calm, but her nerves were fried. They could be heading into a more serious trouble with every move. The water coursing along the tunnel floor soon became a shallow stream, covering Mandy's hands and knees. It was ice cold, but she was less worried about the temperature than about the depth. It would be long before the water came up to the backpack and started to cover Frisbee. Are you all right? Are you all right? Shouted to Amber. Yes. Can you go faster? Maybe. Mandy dug deep and found a reserve of speed and strength she didn't know she had. Her legs and arms swished through the water so that she was half swimming down the tunnel. She could hear Amber splashing through the rising stream just inches beyond. By the time Mandy reached the fork, the water was halfway up her thighs and arms, washing against the backpack and dragging at the sodden fabric. Head left here, she shouted to Amber. The second tunnel was as narrow as the first and seemed to be equally level. So for a while, they were still crawling along in a rapidly rising water. It was pitch black in this tunnel, where there had at least been a glimmer of daylight seeping into the first. She tried not to think about what could happen if the tunnel led nowhere, or worse, took them deeper underground, nearer the level of the river. After a few minutes, Mandy's arms and legs seemed to be moving more freely, as though the water had gotten shallower. After a few minutes, Mandy's arms and legs seemed to be moving more freely, as though the water had gotten shallower. Was it just wishful thinking? She patted the bottom of the backpack. It was wet but it was definitely above the waterline. The water's dropping, she said triumphantly. It's not, said Amber. We're going uphill. The water hasn't reached this high yet. Amber was right. Mandy could feel the ground getting steeper. Was this good news? What if the tunnel ended in another sheer rock? 
Frisbee was growing restless. Mandy could feel him squirming inside the backpack, but there was nothing she could do to help. Just when Mandy thought she couldn't crawl another inch, she saw something that gave her courage. The darkness in the tunnel ahead was sort of hazy, as if it had been pierced by a glimmer of light. Mandy blinked, and when the faint light remained, she felt a, a shiver of excitement. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, she called, and despite the danger they have been in, or perhaps because of, she burst out laughing and repeated the well-worn phrase. After another hundred feet of uncomfortable crawling, they found themselves in another cave, bigger than the first one. But with the same sheer slippery walls, Mandy stood up. It felt so good to be back on her feet. We made it, she shouted at the top of her voice. She took off the backpack and put it on the ground, then lifted Frisbee out and hugged him tightly. What a brave puppy. Amber sat on the floor and leaned against the rocky wall. She smiled up at Mandy. See what I mean? He's amazing. He is, Mandy agreed. It was too early to celebrate, though. They were out of immediate danger, but they were, in a sense, back to square one. Amber was stuck underground with a badly injured ankle, and not far below was an underground river in flood. Mandy looked up at the pothole in the far corner of the cave ceiling. It looked bigger than the first hole, but it was a lot higher. Mandy shielded her eyes from the sky, which, after the darkness in the narrow tunnel, seemed very bright. Suddenly, she realized that it had stopped raining. There were no drops falling down from the hole. Still, there was no time to waste. Wait here, she said to Amber. I wasn't planning on going anywhere, Amber said, wearily. Mandy grinned. I'm going to see if there's any sign of James yet. He must have reached the rescue team by now. She put Frisbee in Amber's lap, then inspected the rocky sides of the pothole, looking for the best way out. But the walls were as smooth as glass, even more difficult to climb than the walls of the first cave. There wasn't a single foothold. Mandy slumped down next to Amber. It looks like I'm going nowhere too. Panic started to rise in her again. We've got to hope that James and the others look for more potholes when they find we're not in the first one. They will, said Amber, but, he, but her worried expression and the fear in her voice gave away her real feelings. Frisbee was sniffing around the backpack trying to lift the flaps with his little black nose. He's hungry, said Amber. She reached into the bag and took out a packet of dog food, the same brand that Mandy had found on Dora's farm. Amber poured some of it into her hand. This is the last bag of dog food. But don't worry, Frisbee, she added. They'll come and get us soon. You won't go hungry. She glanced up at Mandy, her eyes troubled. Linda's going to be so angry with me. She owns the rescue center. I mean, I stole Frisbee, didn't I? Do you think I'll be arrested? Mandy shook her head. I don't think so, she said, hoping she was right. Linda will understand that you were only trying to help Frisbee. Amber looked so worried that Mandy felt a pang of sympathy for her. Mandy realized that she had found a soulmate. Despite everything she'd been through, the danger they were still in, Amber's chief concern was for the puppy not for herself. Mandy couldn't think of anything more comfortable to say, so she scooped out some biscuits from the packet of dog food and helped her cup her hand next to Amber's Frisbee, polish them off in a flash. He's got a good appetite, Mandy said. She offered him another handful, and he was halfway through it when, she sudden, when he suddenly stopped eating. Full already? Mandy teased. Frisbee ignored her. He was staring ahead, his forehead creased in a frown. He's listening to something, whispered Amber. Mandy was impressed. Amber certainly knew the puppy well. Frisbee lifted his nose and looked up. Mandy followed his gaze and saw a dark shape appear over the hole. It was the shape of a head, a dog's head. Blackie, Mandy cried. You found us, you smart boy. Blackie looked over his shoulder and barked until a second face appeared, James. There you are, he cried. We thought something terrible had happened. The other hole was full of water. Something terrible nearly did happen, Mandy told him. 
She tried not to picture the flooded, the flooded pothole. How did you get here? Asked James. It's a long story. I'll tell you later. Mandy called up to him. She was suddenly aware of how cold and wet she was, and when she glanced at Amber, she noticed that her face was deathly pale. Even Frisbee was shivering. Mandy picked him up and cuddled him closely. Hang on, the search team's coming over right now with ropes and things, said James, and he looked away to the signal to someone above ground. The rescue that followed was like something Mandy had seen on TV, never dreamed could happen to her. A rope was lowered into the pothole and a member of the Moorland rescue team repelled swiftly down. With his bright orange overalls and yellow helmet, it was only when he was standing right in front of her that Mandy recognized who it was. Mr. Hardy, she exclaimed, what are you doing here? What do you think I'm doing here? Said a smiling Julianne Harding, slipping off his backpack, bringing you some refreshments from the fox and the goose. Instead of lemonade and some pretzels, he was carrying a first aid kit and a harness. I joined the Moorland rescue team at the end of the summer. This is my first rescue, he explained, as he opened the kit and checked Amber's ankle before seeing if she had any other injuries. When he was satisfied that she could be moved, he said, I think we can hoist you up now. And he strapped her into the harness, supporting her so that she didn't have to put any weight on her bad ankle. Mr. Hardy tugged on the rope and called to someone above ground. You can lift her out now. Slowly, Amber was hauled to the surface where someone helped her away from the pothole. Moments later, the harness was lowered into the hole again. Your turn now, said Julian to Mandy. He noticed the gash above her eye. That doesn't look too good. It's nothing, Mandy said. I'll be fine. She petted Frisbee, who was looking up at her, the pink tumor half filling his eye, a big lump in her throat. If only she could be sure that he was going to be fine too. She put Frisbee in the backpack again, then clutched it firmly while Julian strapped her into the harness. He made sure it was properly fastened before tugging on the rope. She's ready, he called to the above ground. Going up, Mandy said to Frisbee, as the harness pulled tight around her and her feet lifted off the ground. Below her, Julian Hardy stood with his hands on his hips while he watched her being pulled to safety. Careful, she heard someone say as her head bumped against the rim of the hole. Strong hands reached in and grasped her elbows, then eased her out of the hole onto the firm ground. Mandy stood, blinking for a moment, dazzled by the sudden daylight. She was aware of someone unclipping the rope from the harness and draping a thick blanket over her shoulders. Suddenly, a familiar figure rushed up and flung his arms around her. You're safe, James explained. And then, as if he was embarrassed, he turned away to look at the rescue van as if there was the most interesting thing he'd ever seen. Amber was sitting in the back, having her ankle wrapped by a member of the rescue team. There was a blanket over her shoulders, and Mandy noticed that her jacket and jeans were muddy and torn. She glanced down at her ski suit. It was just filthy. Both knees were ripped open. A policeman handed Amber a cell phone and quietly said something to her. She nodded, then hesitated a moment before punching in some numbers and putting the phone to her ear. James took off his glasses and studied them closely before rubbing off a very stubborn but invisible smudge. So you're all okay, he said at last, putting his glasses back on. Frisbee too? I think so, Mandy said, feeling a little dazed. She could feel Frisbee moving around inside the backpack. She looked at Amber again and saw the girl bite her lip before saying, Hello, Mom. Tears started to pour down her cheeks. I'm fine, she whispered into the phone. I'm really sorry. Please tell Linda Davis that I never meant to hurt Frisbee. I only took him because I wanted to for him to have a chance to take care of him. She started to cry so hard that the police officer took the phone from her. Just a badly sprained ankle from the look of it, Miss Hutton. Mandy heard him say, We'll take care of her to Walton Hospital and meet you there. Amber stared at him through her tears and shook her head violently. Mandy wondered what Amber meant. Then her attention was drawn away as one of the rescuers came over to help her out of the harness so that it could be lowered to get Julian in the pothole. Frisbee was struggling so much that the flap of the backpack opened. He peered out and spotted Blackie, who was sitting beside James. The little puppy barked and Mandy felt his tiny little tail thudding against the inside of the bag. It wasn't the normal bark of a dog but a bang sound and immediately identified him as a hound. He wriggled until Mandy lifted him out and put him on the background, on the ground. Blackie dropped to his belly with surprising gentleness. He nudged the little beagle with his nose. Then he flopped over to the side and lay still while the puppy crawled over him. 
He seems fine, James said, surrounding, very relieved. He felt around his pocket, but I bet he's hungry. Mandy didn't have the heart to tell him that Frisbee had a big meal in the cave, but Frisbee scarfed down the tree as if it was the first thing he'd eaten in days. Typical beagle, she called from her seat in the rescue van. They're real gluttons, just like Labradors, volunteered James, handing a treat to Blackie so that he wouldn't feel left out. Mandy was about to say something about not letting Frisbee get too fat, but the sight of the tumor in his eye stopped her. What did it matter if he ate too much? We should let him enjoy life while he has a chance, she thought. Mandy sat in silence on the drive back to Dora's farmhouse. Even the throbbing cut on her forehead couldn't stop her from worrying about what was going to happen to the puppy. It looked as if Amber was having similar thoughts as she cuddled Frisbee on her lap. Mandy reached out and squeezed his arm, wanting her to know that she hated the uncertainty about the puppy's future as much as Amber did. Dr. Emily was waiting anxiously for them in the farm yard. She ran over to meet the van, flung open Mandy's door, and hugged her so tightly that she could hardly breathe. Thank goodness you're all safe. She stepped back to let Mandy climb out and notice the cut on her forehead. She brushed away Amy's, or Mandy's bangs for a closer look and said with a frown, that's probably going to need a stitch or two. We'll have to get you to the hospital. Then seeing Julian Hardy lift Amber out of the side, she added, you too, Amber. Amber shook her head. I'm not going near a hospital, not until she swallowed hard, looked down at the sleeping puppy in her arms. Until what? prompted Dr. Emily. Until you've taken care of Frisbee, Mandy said quietly. Mides of steaming hot chocolate helped to warm them all up. Dora had run inside to prepare it as soon as she saw the van coming down from the moor. Everyone crowded into the living room and drank the cocoa in front of the blazing fire. Mandy solved the problems of Amber's refusal to go to the hospital by suggesting that she go back to Animal Ark with her and her mom and James. Mr. and Mrs. Hutton can meet her there, then take her to the hospital, she said. The police sergeant called Amber's parents. They agreed to the plan when he assured them she didn't seem to be hurt apart from her ankle. Satisfied that Amber was in good hands, the rescue team and police officers started to leave. Just as Julian was about to close the door, Amber called out to him. Thank you, Mr. Hardy, she said. Thank you for everything. Julian smiled at her. I think James deserves a thanks. He's the one who found you. Me? James shook his head. He pointed at Blackie, who was lying in front of the fire. He's a real hero. Once the rescue team had left, Mandy's mom picked up Frisbee to have a look at him. Let's see what the problem is. She said, sitting on the chair with the puppy in her lap. Mandy and Amber sat side by side on the sofa, watching. Frisbee wiggled and wagged his tail as if he thought this was a game. You're not helping me, little fella, Dr. Emily said, smiling. You've got to sit still. I'll hold him for you, Mandy offered. It's all right, said her mom. I can't do a, a thorough examination without the right instruments. I'll wait until we get back to the clinic. Amber was sitting on the edge of the sofa, chewing her nails. Do you have any idea what's wrong with him? Possibly, but I don't want to say anything until I know for certain, replied Dr. Emily. Mandy bit her lip. Was this because her mom didn't want to get their hopes up, or because the truth would be too upsetting for them to deal with? It was nearly time for afternoon clinic hours when they returned to Animal Ark. Dr. Adam hurried out when he heard the Land Rover coming up the driveway. You're very lucky, he said when Mandy climbed out of the vehicle. His voice was muffled against her hair as he hugged her. Dr. Emily had called him from the farmhouse when she knew that Mandy and Amber were safe. So he heard all about their narrow escape. You could have drowned. I guess so, Mandy said, not wanting to think about the way things could have turned out. Dr. Adam helped Amber out of the Land Rover and carried her up the steps into the waiting room. Mandy had a patient to carry in too. Frisbee, while James tied Blackie to the porch and gave him a handful of treats to keep him happy. I'll call your parents to say you're here, Dr. Adam told Amber, settling her in the chair. They'll want to take you right to Walton Hospital to have that ankle treated. Amber shook her head. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying with Frisbee until she stopped and swallowed hard, then looked at the puppy in Mandy's arms, at least until I know what's wrong with him. Then I need to call Linda and tell her everything. I guess you're not going anywhere either, Mandy, said her dad, frowning at the cut on her forehead. Nope, we're not in danger now, she said, and if the words hadn't stuck in her throat, she'd have added, but Frisbee is. 
Let's look at Frisbee now before the other patients start arriving, said Dr. Emily as if she read Mandy's mind. It shouldn't take long. She led the way into her examining room. Amber hopped behind her on one leg, leaning on James' arm. There was hardly a sound in the room while Dr. Emily checked Frisbee's eye. She studied the pink lump and pulled down Frisbee's lower eyelid for a closer look. Then she straightened up and said to Dr. Adam, what do you think? Dr. Adam bent over Frisbee too. A moment or two later, they exchanged a somber look. Mandy's heart dropped to her boots. She put a hand on Amber's arm, ready to comfort her. It's what I thought when I saw Frisbee at the farm, said Dr. Emily. Glandular hypertrophy. Glandular hypertrophy, Amber gasped. Mandy was briefly impressed that she could even pronounce the condition. What's that? Mandy was in the dark too. The unfamiliar term sounded as terrible as it looked. It's also called cherry eye, Dr. Emily explained. It's when the gland of the dog's third eyelid prolapses. Prolapses, echoed James, looking puzzled. Gives way, Dr. Adam translated. That's what causes the pink swelling. Amber was as white as a sheet. It is it, she choked on the words as she fought back tears. Is it serious, said Dr. Emily. Amber nodded. Yes, it is, but it's not life-threatening. Dr. Emily smiled and put her hand on Amber's arm. There's definitely something we can do to help Frisbee. It was the best thing Mandy had heard in days, better even than the sound of James' voice calling them from outside the cave earlier. She turned to Amber and they hugged each other with relief before scooping up Frisbee between them to hug him too. I'm so dramatic sometimes, said Amber, laughing and crying at once. I should have told Linda about Frisbee Eye right away at the beginning. You had no way of knowing, Dr. Emily said kindly. Sometimes fear makes us do things we normally wouldn't. James was standing on the other side of the table, opposite Mandy and Amber. I think you were really brave, Amber, he said. The little beetle must have realized that the mood had changed. He looked around at everyone and wagged his white-tipped tail, then gave a cheerful bark. Amber stroked his head. What's the treatment for cherry eye? An operation, said Dr. Emily. There's a new procedure called the imprecation technique. We cut a sort of pocket into the third eyelid that stitched the swollen gland which is that pink lump back into space. Mandy winced. It sounds complicated. Actually, it's a lot simpler than the operation vets used to do for cherry eye, said Dr. Adam, and it doesn't take nearly as long. More good news, but Mandy knew better than to celebrate just yet. Is the operation always successful? Not always, cautioned em Dr. Emily. Sometimes it has to be done again, but we won't know until a couple of days after the operation. We'll operate first thing in the morning. With any luck, Frisbee could be as good as new by the weekend. Not could be, Mandy corrected her mom, will be. And now that you know what's wrong with Frisbee, we have to call your parents, Amber, said Dr. Adam. And you get to the doctor, Mandy. Maybe you can go to the hospital with Amber. But neither of them wanted to leave Frisbee. Who'll look after him, Aunt Mandy protested. Through the open door of the treatment room, she could see people starting to arrive with their pets. Very soon, both of her parents would be too busy to be able to keep an eye on the puppy. I'll take care of him, offered James, and handled Blackie at the same time, Mandy asked doubtfully. After some more persuading, Dr. Emily gave in and called the local doctor, Dr. Mason, who agreed to come over to examine Amber and Mandy. But if he says you need to go to the hospital, there'll be no argument from either of you, Dr. Adam warned before picking up the phone to call Mr. and Mrs. Hutton. Mandy and Amber exchanged glances and nodded reluctantly. Okay, but only if we absolutely have to, Mandy said and sighed. Dr. Mason confirmed that Amber's ankle was badly sprained, but they didn't need to go to the hospital. He bandaged it firmly and said she'd have to walk on crutches. He brought along a pair in the trunk of his car. For a week or two until it had healed, the cut on Mandy's forehead was deep but wouldn't need stitches. I can't believe how lucky you are, commenting James after Dr. Mason had left. They were in the living room watching the wildlife program on TV. Mandy and Amber were on the sofa with Frisbee, tumbling around on their laps, and James was lying on his stomach with Blackie stretched out next to him. He still looked a little pale, as though losing the girls down a pothole had shot him to the core. Amber had telephoned Linda Davis at the Little Briar Dog Rescue Center to explain exactly what was wrong with Frisbee and to say how sorry she was for taking him. 
Mandy could tell it wasn't an easy call to make. Amber came back looking tearful, but in the end, Linda had understood that she'd only acted out of love for the puppy, and as long as they were both safe, that was all that mattered. Miss Davis had even said that Amber was welcome to come back to help out at the center as soon as her ankle was better. There was a tap at the door and Jean the receptionist came in. Visitors, she announced, and stepped aside to let them through. Amber, cried an auburn-haired woman. She ran over to the sofa and flung her arms around the girl. 